is the prenatal and newborn development video. So this is going to uh, connect to your second set of video notes for this unit. Um, since we just got done doing our general intro to development, let's talk about uh, what happens for you to exist in the first place. So in terms of conception, when a male sperm fertilizes a female's egg, voila, that is when conception occurs, okay? So at this point, the egg is gonna block all other sperm uh, and so that will help to facilitate uh, the fertilization process. Women are born with all the eggs they will ever have, okay? Um, which is a pretty staggering statistic since one in 5,000 actually mature. So this also lends kind of the credence to the evolutionary perspective of women have to pair wisely, um, that you have a finite set chance of being able to uh, have a child and pass down your genetic material, so you have to be very smart and picky about who it is that you get together with in terms of that genetic material. Men don't begin producing sperm until puberty, um, and then they will produce it 24-7 for the rest of their life, again, as we learned about in that intro to development stuff. So, once you are conceived, you are a one-shell entity that has 23 pairs of chromosomes, okay? One part of the pair is from the mother, the other part of the pair is from the father, and each chromosome has thousands of genes on it, okay? They are either individual um, or they are combinations of, you know, stuff from mom and dad, um, and all of those genes are going to produce the particular characteristics that make you, you. So, those genes are composed of deoxyribonucleic acid, Okay, your DNA, and some genes are going to be responsible for the development of uh, much of the physiological aspects of you, your heart, your circulatory system, brain, lungs, things like that. Others are going to control characteristics that will end up making you slightly more unique or different, your eye color, height, facial features, things along those lines, um, and those are all, you know, the physical components. Sex is also going to be determined by your combination of genes based off of the 23rd chromosome. And as you heard me talk about earlier, um, the Y chromosome comes from the male. So if you are XX, then you are going to be female. If you are XY, then you will be male. So let's talk prenatal development because initially you are that one singular cell organism, but once you become the fully fertilized egg, okay, you are a zygote. Okay. Here is the interesting thing. Fewer than half of zygotes end up surviving the first two weeks. And in terms of pregnancy numbers, one in five pregnancies ends in a miscarriage uh, before the first trimester ends. Okay? So if you think about it in that regard, um, the fact that you know, many of us exist in the first place is a, is a pretty phenomenal look at, you know, at things just in terms of a probability standpoint. Once you are, uh, once you've made it into week two, you are considered to be an embryo, okay? At the embryonic stage, you have developed by the, uh, by about halfway through that stage at week four, um, you are, uh, your heart is beating, and it's very, very, very uh, rudimentary uh, and simplistic, but it's there. There is a brain and an intestinal tract, okay? They are incredibly primitive, but they are capable of being identified and recognized. Um, the digestive tract, for example, is going to be one of the last things that will develop in you, um, and it will still be developing to some extent after you are born. Uh, and we'll talk about that with, um, uh, with some of the activities that we do in class with one another. Uh, by eight weeks, the embryo is roughly an inch long, has arms, legs, and a face that are distinct. Okay, um, you guys are going to get to see a picture of uh, Eliza at seven and a half weeks um, because she was considered to be um, initially um, a high-risk pregnancy for me. And so I went in at seven and a half weeks and received an ultrasound then. Um, so you'll get to see what she looks like because we, we, we kind of look like lizards when we're first in this kind of uh, embryonic stage and moving into the beginning portions of, of the fetal uh, development or the fetus stage, we we look like we have a tail. Um, it's kind of fascinating. So you guys are going to get to see her, the first picture that I ever actually got to see of, of my baby girl. So six days old, this is when uh, you can see the, that one single cell organism is starting to replicate. 
um, and duplicate by four weeks. Uh, this is what you look like. So now you understand what I was talking about with that whole like little tail thing going on. And then this is eight weeks. And so this was just about what Eliza looked like uh, when she uh, got her very first picture taken because um, she, she was a little over seven and a half weeks at that point. Um, and so this is, every one of you guys looked like this when you were itty, 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 bitty. Once you have moved uh, from week eight to birth, you are considered to be a fetus. So we go in terms of order, zygote, embryo, fetus. I would write that down for yourself because it will definitely help you to remember that order of things. By about four months, the fetal movement is pretty strong and it is capable of being detected by the mom. So you're looking at roughly uh, around 16 weeks that the mother is going to be able to start feeling the baby kick. And now obviously there are wiggle room pieces to this um, because some women have been able to report earlier experiences. I actually first felt Eliza at 11 weeks. Um, and it, it's really funny. It feels kind of like, uh, like a fluttering or a muscle spasm. Um, and some women have uh, reported that it feels kind of like feeling of butterflies, um, like, you know, when you get that kind of feeling in your tummy. Um, and some report it feeling like indigestion. <laughs> um, personally, I don't, I don't know where you can differentiate on that because I had some pretty hardcore indigestion the whole way through, not just the, the morning sickness, but awful heartburn to the bitter end. Uh, but by month six, the eyelids are capable of opening at that point. Um, and the fetus has a very well um, developed taste bud structure um, and they can grasp things. So it's not uncommon for you to see in ultrasounds and sonograms them um, grabbing the umbilical cord or, or even playing with their hands in the grasp that they've got. Once the fetus has hit 24 weeks, it is considered to be the age of viability, okay? so. Um, Ultimately, why that's called the age of viability is because about 50% of babies, of preemie babies, survive at that age. And as each week passes, that percentage goes up and up and up and up. Okay, um, so it is more likely for multiples, twins, triplets, uh, quadruplets in some circumstances, to be born premature. Um, and so in any circumstance, you are really, 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 really hoping to get that uh, fetal development to that 24-week point because there is a 50% shot that the uh, baby, once it is out of the mother, is going to have the capacity to survive. Fetuses will grow and they will gain weight during the last two months. Um, and then at the end of a normal 38-week, which is roughly nine and a half months, that's when they're going to weigh around seven pounds um, and be about 28 or excuse me, 20 inches in length. So I gave birth at 38 weeks. So Eliza was pretty early uh, for a first pregnancy. Most of the time, first pregnancies will go to that 40 week point, possibly even 41 weeks. Um, those first babies like to stay in there for a little while. So she was born fairly early. Um, and so she actually was um, a little bit under that average. She was born at six pounds, six ounces. Um, and she was pretty tiny in terms of size. She got stuck with her mama's height. Uh, and she was uh, 18 and a half inches. Uh, and then they, they measured her again, and then they said she was 19. So we're kind of not really sure one way or the other. But regardless, she was, she was pretty small, and she still is. It's important to recognize, uh, and we covered this in the development content, that um, nurturing happens in the womb. So there are certain things that mothers have to be very, 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 very mindful of when it comes to the development of their fetus, okay? So certainly genetic factors can play a role in this, uh, in the fetal development, specifically something called phenylketonuria, um, which is a genetic defect that comes from the fact that the genes and the chromosomes just don't combine the right way. Um, there's also something called Tay-Sachs disease, where the body does not have the capacity to break down fat, and so those substances end up building up in the fetus's body and they destroy the brain and the nerve cells. Um, and so what ends up happening is that the nervous system shuts down. Babies that are uh, born with this, they exhibit signs um, around four to six months, and they're usually going to end up dying by the age of five. Um, it, is, it, is a, it is an awful, awful, awful thing to witness. If parents both carry the genetic defect, the child has a one in four chance of being born with the disease. So that shows its high level of heritability. Um, it 
does tend to seem to occur more frequently in Central and Eastern European Jewish populations and their descendants. Um, not entirely sure why that's the case. Ultimately, since it is genetically predisposed, um, you know, if, and, and we tend to couple with those that we see as similar to us. Um, so Jewish uh, people do tend to marry within their faith. And so there is that higher likelihood of the genetics combining to create that possibility. Um, and then the most famous genetic influence with regard to development is Down syndrome. Now, that happens when a zygote gets an extra chromosome when conception occurs, okay? This can cause what is considered to be mental retardation. We'll talk about this in terms of uh, when we hit the intelligence content and developmental disorders in Unit 12. Um, usually, this is going to be within the mild to moderate range, though. It's not typically something super severe. It relates to a mother's age. Um, we do see that there is a higher likelihood of a child being born with Down syndrome um, in babies that are born with mothers over the age of 35. Characteristics are often um, most commonly connected to the facial features. That seems to be, for, for many, kind of the identifying characteristic for those with Down syndrome. Um, they have kind of slanted eyes, a smaller nose, ear and mouth. Uh, ears and mouth, and um, they do tend to have shorter necks and smaller hands. Um, sometimes what can be present in those with Down syndrome is other health problems. They can have issues with vision, with their hearing, some struggles with their heart, um, but that's not always the case. Uh, and you're starting to see significant um, demonstrations of um, Oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Tip of the tongue phenomenon. Um, advancements for people within the Down syndrome community. You're starting to see a lot more children being included in modeling, for example. Um, in, you know, for children's clothes, there are more and more Down syndrome um, women who are becoming models, for example. Um, as adults, they're going into gymnastics, not just for Special Olympics, but for, um, for the regular Olympics as well. Um, so it's a pretty fascinating change and an awesome change to be able to see. In terms of the environmental component, the nurture stuff, the big piece here is teratogens. Number one teratogen that virtually every you know, person is aware of is uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. If mom drinks, that ends up having some significant impact on a uh, fetus's development. But there are other teratogens that are out there because these are any kind of environmental agents uh, that can end up producing birth effects. So, uh, if the mother catches rubella, for example, um, that can cause blindness, deafness, ha heart abnormalities. The baby can even be born, um, have a stillbirth. You can have, uh, if you catch syphilis through a sexually transmitted disease, it can cause mental retardation and physical deformities, even miscarriage, multiple miscarriages for the mother. AIDS can pass uh, prior to the child at birth. And as, we're, uh, as we've kind of touched on a little bit in previous units, um, mom's use of drugs, things like cocaine, heroin, they can all involve the baby being born addicted to those substances and then having um, some significant struggles cognitively as they grow and develop as children. Um, nicotine use can also have an impact. Smoking uh, leads to fewer nutrients being received by the fetus, and so that causes low birth weight, which can have a um, pretty, pretty significant impact on the uh, child's development once they're born. And there is also some research that heavy smoking affects the brain development that they have. And uh, as you heard me talk about with fetal alcohol syndrome with FAS, um, abnormalities include um, small eyes, um, upturned nose, and um, brain sizes are typically smaller and also abnormal in shape. But that doesn't limit the other things that could be factors uh, for teratogens. For example, um, one of the big things right now that is that you'll see pretty commonly is uh, that pregnant moms will not eat lunch meat unless it has been heated up in the microwave uh, for at least 30 seconds. Seems kind of random. Why is that the case? Because lunch meat um, can carry listeria, which is a bacteria that is significantly impactful for fetal development. Um, so when I was pregnant, anytime I would have a sandwich, I would take it um, and I would nuke it in the microwave for 30 seconds uh, in order to make sure that it was okay. Or if I would go to Subway, I normally like to get my sandwiches cold, but with that, I would have to do it where I would have them put it in, you know, in the toaster oven and, and warm it up for me. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about a number of those things because it's pretty fascinating some of the stuff that you have to be very mindful of when you're pregnant. 
you, for all intents and purposes, have to be a hypochondriac and anxious of every little thing that you eat just to make sure that it's all um, going to be safe for, for the baby while they develop. So let's talk about newborns. All babies are born with some aspects of reflex, okay? So instinctual, unlearned, involuntary responses. You heard us talk about these when we learned about instinct theory in Unit 8, for example. We made mention to it in class. So these are automatically present in babies when they're born. They tend to go away over time, and usually by six months, they end up being presented uh, or replaced with more complex behaviors. So let's talk about a couple of these. The reality is, yes, we will need to know what these guys are for the test, so keep these in mind. Rooting reflex, it's their automatic attempt to turn their head when their cheek is touched, okay? A lot of times that is because um, it's to help facilitate them learn how to nurse from the mother. The second reflex is that they're, again, this is going to help them with regard to facilitating eating. Um, they're going to attempt to suck anything that touches their lips. So that's why um, a lot of times if you, you know, let them, you know, if you give them a finger, you know, start looking at something with their mouth, they're immediately going to start trying to, to eat it. Um, that's why they love binkies, um, pacifiers, whatever it is that you want to call them. Um, the startle reflex is that um, infants, when there are loud noises that startle them, hence the name, um, and they're just very, very sudden. What they're going to do is they're going to take their arms and they're going to flail them out. And they're going to arch their back and they're just going to go, whoa! And they're going to fan their fingers out like this, too. There goes my, uh, my, my heater again. Um, and so because that is just the automatic response for them. And then more, li more than likely, in many respects, they're going to start crying after that happens, too. Um, Eliza was pretty notorious for that one. The Papinski reflex is when you... Um, stroke the sole of the foot right down here, their toes are automatically going to just splay out like that, which is kind of an interesting little thing. Um, they, part of the thought process behind it is that um, it kind of helps them to um, facilitate learning how to walk and to uh, ultimately be able to kind of um, put their feet out like that to be able to, to learn how to um, balance on their two feet. Then you have the Palmer reflex. This is to their tendency to just whatever you put in their hand, they're gonna they're gonna grab it as fast as they possibly can. So if you take you know a finger and you are you know looking at their tiny little their little hands when they're born, they're automatically gonna just take their finger and just grab right around it. Um, put a toy in there, put a blanket, you know, like a little um, binky or anything along those lines. They're they're just the automatic response is just to hold it. Now. That is the end of this set of notes, um, a little bit on average about what we're uh, moving through in terms of tick per page for the notes packets. Um, we'll do a lot more in class talking about these things. Uh, you guys are going to be um, given the wonderful opportunity to see an awful lot of um, videos and demonstrations of some of this stuff from Eliza. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll go a little more in depth on some stuff to make it a little bit easier to differentiate between these things. Um, but as is always the case, if you've got any questions, just let me know.